the government funding, or how did that, how did that happen? Yeah, I, I probably, I mean, look, it was, it, all these things are a team effort, but I certainly uh, had the lead, um, you know, back in the day when we uh, originally contemplated these sorts of, this sort of, pr the program that we were ultimately funded by, which was back in 2006. Yeah. Um, I was probably the only one at the table who had any government experience, as, as, uh, as uh, brief as that was. I spent two years uh, working with a huge opportunity to work for Secretary Powell in the State Department, but I'm not a professional in the government, and it was a sort of brief period of time. But for, for all of that, I, I was the one who'd been to Washington most recently. So we got this program started. Um, we advocated for the technology, for the brand. Uh, on the merits of what we were doing. It happened to fit uh, a program that uh, was part of the, uh, the 05 energy uh, bill, um, a program that was sort of improved or changed somewhat in the 07 energy bill, and ultimately uh, that's the program that, uh, uh, that we were approved for a loan from. So that loan uh, uh, will help us to do two things. One, uh, to expand our powertrain manufacturing facilities. So these are powertrains batteries, motors, and power electronics, and the system that brings it all together, that we will sell to other auto manufacturers so they can build their own EVs using our technology. And then it will also give us the ability to, make a to create a manufacturing operation for our second car, the Model S, uh, a vehicle which is vastly different from the Roadster behind me. It is uh, uh, half the cost, uh, less than half the cost, and uh, more than twice the utility. It's a five-passenger uh, plus two, seven-passenger sedan, effectively. Um, with, uh, with, a, with a variety of ranges, up to 300 miles of range, um, and that'll be in the market by 2011. So those two programs funded by the government effort. There was a little bit of controversy, I think, around the fact that money was going to somebody who was selling sports cars or $100,000 sports cars in, in early on. Yeah, well, that, uh, you know, the, unfortunately, everybody's activities around this stuff were conflated together. Um, the monies that we accessed were not part of the bailout of GM and Chrysler. That was a balance sheet bailout, quite different from what we're doing. Uh, it had nothing to do with subsequent bankruptcy efforts. And most importantly, it has nothing to do with the Roadster program. Nothing, nada, not at all. It doesn't help us sell the Roadster, improve the Roadster, anything. Unrelated. Uh, that the, the requirements for how we use the funds uh, are very stringent. They are all focused on two forward projects. One, the, the much more affordable sedan that advances the technology and, and the whole category. And two, the powertrain facility, which advances, again, the technology, uh, as well as, and this is important, creates an export opportunity. We're already selling these powertrains to a foreign automaker, Daimler, uh, and that's a very good story. So, you know, it, Neither bailout nor stimulus, a program that was originally conceived in 2005 uh, and just happened to be funded around the time that all this other stuff took, took I mean, place. I think that's one of the great things that she was talking about is that it's not just about selling cars to Tesla, it's about also really advancing the technology. Yeah, I mean, the, the mission of this company, pure and simple, is to uh, stimulate, uh, create a mass market for EVs. And our part in doing that is to, one, create cars that are exciting, that demonstrate the technology, that are ever more affordable and in ever greater, that are produced in ever greater numbers. And then on the second, in the second hand, to sell our powertrains to other manufacturers who are, frankly, more proficient at making, at this point, making cheaper cars. They, they've been doing this for a long time. Just take our powertrain and design one of those cars that you do. Take advantage of all of your economies and scale, and God bless go make EVs. So that's, that's really, that's how we're doing it. Are you working on standards for the industry or are you up to make agreements with other companies in order to push uh, like an electric standard plug for high voltage? And all? We don't spend a lot of time theorizing uh, about how we can bring everybody together around standards. We're, we're focused most, uh, from, foremost on creating standards just by doing what we're doing. I mean, that's how it's all going to happen. That's how most standards have evolved. Sure, there's been significant negotiation around certain key standards out there. But right now, the importance is much more on getting this technology out there. The market will sort out which systems work out best. We've started with the proposition that whatever we're doing, it has to fit into the existing uh, 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 electrical infrastructure. So this, this car can plug right into that outlet. So it's a very simple, talk about standards, like we're just taking the, the existing ones. Um, uh, is, I mean, I don't know if there's an imperative to create a single standard battery. I frankly think that's probably not a good idea because it retards progress and improvement over the course of time. 
Um, and then on other fronts, certainly there are, there's a need for uh, information protocols to make uh, vehicles uh, talk to talk to the grid in future iterations. That's all possible. But right now, the pressure is on getting stuff out there, out there, creating facts on the ground, and the standards will take care of themselves. On the agreement with Daimler, is Daimler in, um, because they just bought a, a stake in the company, also, right? So, do they uh, collaborate with you in the research and development of the powertrains you guys are using? The most visible aspect of Daimler's partnership with us is probably the least important. They, they acquired 9% of the company, and that's great. The money is helpful in advancing what we're doing. The most important elements are in strategic agreements around uh, cooperation on current vehicle programs, future vehicle programs, and so forth. So the answer is yes. We are cooperating with them in terms of uh, uh, access to the supply chain, in terms of vehicle engineering, vehicles that we're doing, vehicles that they're doing. It's all there. The German government announced by 2010 they want at least a million electric vehicles on the road. Do you want to try to take advantage of that by selling Teslas directly there or by selling powertrains to Daimler? Both. Both. The simple answer is both. Um, so, yeah, we intend to do both. Okay. And you recently moved your head, you're going to move your headquarters to the Stanford Business Park. Why did you choose like Silicon Valley in general to have your operations? Is there something particular about Silicon Valley, the DNA here, the innovation? you chose to have your headquarters here? Or like, why didn't you choose to have like, your headquarters in Detroit? We started here. Mm -hmm. We started here, and, um, and the reason I think we've been successful to date is because we are uh, repurposing the existing talent here uh, uh, in that, that, that led to the vast advancements in, uh, uh, in computer technology, information technology, and so forth. Many of these technologies are common and important to the development of, of electric vehicles. And so um, really, uh, you know, it makes sense that, that this effort started here. And going forward, it makes perfect sense to keep it uh, headquartered here. Obviously, uh, we are becoming more and more of a car company. Uh, as we become more and more of a car company, we will become more geographically uh, diversified. Uh, we're planning to do our Model S manufacturing in Southern California. Uh, it's conceivable that we will be even more geographically diversified as we pursue other vehicles going forward. Have a facility in Europe, Asia. I exclude nothing. It's hard to it's hard to you know project the next ten years, but if we're successful, I mean we have ambitions in all of these markets, and to the extent that it's logical to do business there, we will. You see, in the midterm, the arrival of a compact car, compact sports car made by Tesla or at least? Certainly, yes, yes. Yeah, we're very interested in, in that uh, and are pursuing it. I mean, we, we, have to, we have to focus on what we're doing right now, which is, um, which is building the Model S, which is the current project that's been funded to continue to help others make, uh, like Daimler, uh, to make uh, more compact and less expensive EVs. Uh, but we very much want to get to uh, a a less expensive. But, that's, but that relies on a couple of things. One, it relies on us continuing to iterate the technology, to take cost out of the drivetrain, to build capacity in manufacturing, because it's all of those things that allow us to, uh, to achieve lower price points. The economies of scale are... Correct. Correct. And do you think that, that how soon do you see kind of 50% of people driving electric? So what do you sort of think? I know it's a hard question, a dumb question, but like, how fast do you see this happening? Look, um, I mean, historically, the vehicle fleet has turned over uh, relatively slowly. I think one of the numbers I've heard is 15 years. Um, and I, frankly, I don't know if that's a U.S. number, if that's an international number. There are ways of provoking that number, as we've just done with Cash for Clunkers, as they've done in Europe with a similar program. Um, so it relies to a degree on how, pe how quickly people turn over their existing vehicles, uh, and then to a degree on how quickly we improve and iterate the technology. I, I think that by 2030, the majority of vehicles on the road will be electric vehicles. It, I mean, and it may be the vast majority.